Um, welcome everybody to this morning's event, Urban Futures, How Can Cities Deliver Global Goals? You note I've said global goals, not the global goals, to be discussed later on. Um, this is part of ODI's Global Challenge event series, um, and we've got lots of you in the room today, but we're also delighted to be joined by hundreds of people watching this event online. And I'd very much encourage you to send us your questions. I've got an iPad here, and I can check in on who is contributing from the live stream as well as people in the room. Um, do please tweet the event. Um, details here, hashtag global challenges. Uh, tweet us your questions, send us your questions, or, or just put your hand up if you're in the room. Uh, my name's Elizabeth Stewart, and I'm head of the uh, Growth, Poverty and Inequality program here at ODI, and I lead the Institute's work on the Sustainable Development Goals as well. And um, the reason why we wanted to have the event here today, rather than in Quito a few days ago, was because we want this to be a readout of, of Habitat, a kind of a stock check, a check-in, and a kind of an a place to have a, a kind of an inflection point, if you like, of we have the new urban agenda. How does this sit with the global goals that have already been agreed? So with the COP, with the Paris Agreement, and with the Sustainable Development Goals. How does this all work together? And what's our what's our kind of collective takeaway from Habitat? What's our readout from Habitat? And what next? Having had Habitat in the context of the SDGs and Paris. Where does this leave people if you're thinking about urban development, urban issues, and if you're or if you are a mayor uh, of a city in uh, Ghana, we'll introduce Mayor Odumton. Where does this leave you? What, what's the value added of all these new global agreements and how they're going to how they're going to sit together? Um, we at ODI have been increasingly engaging with the urbanization agenda. It's an, it's a growing priority for us. We held a full day Urban Futures event last year that Paula um, helped lead on. Um, we've been, out of my program, we've been producing uh, a significant amount of research on uh, issues around data and poverty measurement in urban settings. We've looked at slum upgrading, what are the policies needed to have safe, resilient cities. So we've produced case studies on uh, Amnabad, on Lima, in Bangkok. Uh, colleagues in other programs, so across the politics and governance program and climate and finance programs have been doing work on migration. We recently launched um, a briefing on urbanization and migration. Um, they're working on urbanization and sanitation issues, and we're also doing a body of work on road safety. So this is, this is a growing part of, of our agenda. Why is it a priority? I probably don't need to spell this out to anyone in the room. You wouldn't be here if it, you didn't agree it was a priority. You know, we're now in a time when the majority of people live in an urban setting. Across the developing world, a billion people live in informal settlements, while also, uh, obviously, cities are host to uh, extreme wealth, so they are the locus of extreme inequality. Um, the number of people living in informal settlements is set to treble by 2050, so this is going to be an increasing problem. And we need to think about, you know, as I've said, with these uh, amalgam of new goals and agreements, what is it that needs to be done next to take this urban agenda forward? So without more ado, let me introduce my speakers. So I'm going to introduce you first to Mayor Odomton, who is uh, joining us online, and we've got a good connection. Uh, Tema is, a, I'll, I'll introduce Tema a little bit more, I'll say a little bit more about Tema in a minute, but it's um, the port of Accra, basically. It's a city home to about 350,000 people. Uh, to my right, we have Billy Cobbett um, from the Cities Alliance, and to my left, I have my colleague Paola Lucci, who's a research fellow here at ODI. So, um, if I could turn to you first, Billy, and I, I, I think we're going to have a pleasantly um, uh, frank uh, conversation with you, which is what we want. What, the things we like to do at Global Challenges event is have a real dialogue. Um, hopefully with some, maybe there's some disagreement, but certainly uh, shining the, uh, a spotlight of honesty and frankness on some of the more kind of complex issues around development. So um, Billy's director of the Cities Alliance, as I said, uh, which is, a, I'm sure many of you again in the room know, it's a global partnership 
for urban poverty reduction. Uh, before that, Billy was uh, chief of the shelter branch of UN Habitat. So again, we're delighted to have you joining us from Brussels. You know, Billy, I've, I've, I've set out, we've got this, you know, this new paradigm, the new urban agenda on top of the SDGs and on top of uh, Paris. Um, and of course, Paris also saw not only national level commitments, but mayors themselves making mm -hmm. very ambitious um, climate reduction com uh, commitments, target uh, emission reduction commitments. I wanted to ask you through your work, how, how, how do you see this lens? What, what are the value of these new agendas? So how does the new urban agenda add to the SDGs, specifically SDG 11 and climate? And also from your experience, from your work, what's going well? What sort of you know, urban programs do you see that are actually delivering change for resilient, safe, inclusive cities at the moment? So five minutes over to you. <laughs> It's not a five-minute question. No, good morning. It's a small question. Good, my, good morning to my friend, the mayor of in Tema. Uh, nice to see you. Um, my pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Um, I need to reflect and 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 turn this into a post-keto conversation. Um, so the, I think my headline would be, okay, the international conferencing is over and the agenda has been set. Um, however you interpret the agenda, for me, it's very clearly. Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development uh, is the benchmark uh, negotiated, approved at the United Nations. All member states adopted it. And of course, Paris uh, 21 is really what, what frames our, our challenge. The new urban agenda, which is what was adopted in Quito two weeks ago and which is a follow on from the Habitat Agenda of 1996, adds momentum and, in, in our view, uh, provides a framework for sub-national governments, regional and city, to achieve the post-2015 agreement. But these are not competing agendas. So the ones that have to be reported upon is Agenda 2030. The one that is going to be measured most closely, of course, is going to be Paris because of the impact on, uh, it's, it's the, because of the existential nature of the threat to which we face. So. For me, it's, it's relatively clear that this is one package and the agenda, the discussion now urgently needs to move away from scene setting and target setting into asking and answering the question, how are we actually going to implement everything that has been agreed? Because now there's nowhere left to hide. We're not waiting for the next conference to finalize something. And that's where I think the challenge becomes very, very real. Because let me spell out um, some of the immediate challenges. There still remains very much a national government-driven agenda. And that's not critical or uncritical. It's just a statement of fact. And that is, that is how international, bilateral, and multilateral arrangements take place. So it's national governments that have to set the agenda. What is missing at many national government, at, at many uh, national nation-state levels is, number one, consensus, and two, is a sense of the urgency that is required. Is, and for me, what is missing, to a large extent, from the new urban agenda is the sense of, of urgency that we should have in how to respond to. Because there's warm feelings are wonderful, but if we don't, it, it's completely underestimated the amount of which we have to turn around patterns of consumption, patterns of production, our human settlements patterns, so, immediate priorities, one, would be to transform the relationship between national and local governments, to make sure that you assign rights and responsibilities and resources at the appropriate level. Easy to say, it's a huge political fight everywhere in the world. The second is to transform the relationship between cities and their citizens, both individual and corporate. But in particular, and I want in your mind's eye to think of less of London and Barcelona and more of the Temers and the hundreds and thousands of cities of medium size that are going to double and triple in size over the next two to three decades. We don't know their names, but actually that's where the real challenge is going to be uh, won or lost. Uh, you know, London's not in trouble or Barcelona's not in trouble, just to pick on those two, but many, many cities, the third or fourth largest city in a given country is in trouble for a variety of reasons. So in transforming the relationship between cities and citizens, particularly, and this is the image that I have in my mind, is the, the policy shift between the politics of exclusion, 
most local governments actually push the urban poor out in terms of uh, both physically and politically, as opposed to bringing them in. And that's the image we have to change. And within, so there's organizations of the urban poor. Most growth of, of cities is informal. That's a starting point, not a problem. We have to work out how to respond to that. And then, in particular, the, the politics of gender at the, at the local level has the potential to be transformative. At the moment, it is almost entirely negative. And that goes all the way through from <laughs> land, services, and access to citizenship to a whole range of social relations. And let me pick on, because I'm going to give you too many challenges, the three, three big ones. I'm not going to say these are the biggest, uh, but number one, local government capacity. We keep saying local governments, cities will. They will do this, and they'll solve climate change, and they'll, they'll dr drive the economy and everything else. Most local governments that we are talking about do not have the requisite skills and staff and staff retention to be able to actually manage a city as an ongoing enterprise. That's the first challenge. That's a 20 to 30 year challenge, not an 18 month project. You have to put it in simple terms. How do we turn local government into a career opportunity for professionals to move into? That's the rethinking that needs to happen at the first place. The second is the, this mismatch between the short term and the long term. We need massive investment in infrastructure within cities and between cities to achieve the promise we keep talking about. So if, we, if cities are going to, and historically have, driven national level economies, you can't do this either on paraffin as an energy source or on dirt roads and, and with the levels of or mortalities we have on, on connecting cities and within cities. Complete rethink. But where is the investment going to come from? Because this is not the business of aid. This is long-term investment with returns. So the whole environment for where is the investment climate going to come from to achieve this? And then the, one minute for your last question. I will do that. Um, and then the third, and it's linked to that, is how do we unblock uh, the finances for investment, and what are the essential conditions that have to be play in play at the national and local level in order to achieve not just uh, um, concessional finance from multilateral organizations, but r your real test of sustainability is investment by the residents themselves in their own city and investment by the domestic private sector into those cities. So they're all tough questions. Technically, none of these is difficult. We know the answers to all of these. It's getting what I find missing is somewhere between a sense of urgency and constructive panic would be appropriate uh, for the state that we're in in many of the cities where the bulk of the growth is taking place. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, as you say, not, not small challenges, but um, that's, that gives us a lot. That's a very good place to kick off the conversation. Um, Mayor Odomton, I could ask you if you're in a state of constructive panic, but you look, you look extremely calm. Uh, that might be because I know that your vision has been to transform Tema into a smart, futuristic, economically booming city, and that you're already some way down the road in achieving that, which I think is very exciting news, particularly because this is exactly the kind of urban setting that, Billy, you were just talking about, could be the locus of the biggest challenge in the near future. Um, can you talk to us, Mayor, about what well, I want to know two things. One is, are you finding these global goals, so the SDGs, particularly we've heard about the importance and the primacy of the SDGs and the climate goals, but you know we have a the sort of additional context of the new urban agenda. Are you finding them helpful? Are you finding them, how do they make your life easier? Or do they feel like a sort of plethora of new commitments that, you, that make, leave you feeling a bit confused? And secondly, how are you going to, the progress that you're already making, how do you think that's going to be changed by the existence of these goals? How is it going to change the way you measure your progress? And if I could ask you for the sort of your top tip for what you're doing right. All in right. five minutes. <laughs> yes. I will try and do just that. But uh, I want to appreciate all of you on this special October uh, 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 urban uh, day which we all recognizing that the conferencing and conferences are over. The agendas have been set. And it is time for us to 
move swiftly into implementation. These are the words of Billy. And Billy has been a strong proponent of how we actualize the agendas that we set. And for us in Tema, indeed, um, we are not in a state of panic. But we do recognize that we have a huge gap. And that gap, as Billy enumerated in his third three-point submission, I'll try and touch on that uh, later. But I think that the global agenda is very, very pl well placed to supporting national, uh, sub-national, and local government uh, practitioners to find space within the global agendas that are set. I think when that is done, the comfort is that we are doing something that either has been tried and tested in other jurisdictions that experts have reviewed over the period, and we can find synergies because others are currently looking at them. And so to that extent, I think that the global agendas that are being set for, uh, would not make us deviate or change course altogether and set the wheels backward. Probably in one or two areas, we may see that. Um, let me also look at the national uh, issue. We in Ghana, we have said that, yes, what we need is a strong commitment and a strong leadership. And I think our president is already demonstrating a very strong commitment to ensuring implementation of the uh, global goals and the agenda we have set for ourselves. Let me say this. The way in which the current president has empowered our National Development Planning Commission uh, deserves commendation by all the key actors. When the president announced through the National Development Planning Commi Commission uh, the 40 year strategic plan, many people thought that 40 years was too long um, a time, too long a strategic uh, a plan, uh, but we thought that it is better for us to envision that long term. And Billy mentioned it. There's always a competition and a conflict between long term versus short term, most often politically motivated decisions that will not feed into that long term, really transformational and sustainable uh, uh, development agenda that we're setting for ourselves. So I think it should go on record that Ghana has taken the lead and below the a 40 year development plan. We have a four year rolling budget that is drawn from this plan through what we call the Ghana Shared Growth Development Agenda Phase Two. And this is what drives the key areas and focus areas for the local governments. And so when these uh, um, shared growth and development agendas are fashioned, the Ministry of Finance is involved, the local government and uh, rural development is involved, and the commission itself. And so we are able to gain acceptance. We are able to gain uh, uh, ownership at the local uh, government level. And once ownership is gained, we find space through community participation to now align the specific needs of our communities uh, with what the national agenda is. When this is achieved, you would realize that it becomes much easier. Obviously, we cannot say that every city in Tema is looking at this global, national, and sub-national agendas. But the way in which our um, decentralized system operates, we have six metropolitan assemblies. And so these six are becoming the examples. They are becoming the focus and trust areas for implementing such laudable global ideas. For example, if we have to unlock finance, drive the needed implementation, Ghana is leading the way to say that, okay, we shall go into municipal bonds, but we shall not open the floodgates to all. We'll look at the assemblies or the uh, district assemblies that have the capacity to go onto the market and float or offer uh, municipal bonds to finance the implementation of sustainable development goals. And so we can see clearly that the commitment is high. Again, if we need to make the necessary changes, capacity, capacity building is, is key. And we have a whole sector. Part of our urban development program is what we call the uh, local government capacity support. 
And this is a regular support that is building the capacities of local government uh, administrators and the key actors, including civil society organizations, faith-based organizations, and the local communities to ensure that, yes, not only are we expecting foreign experts, but we can also make use of local experts who understand the local conditions better to input crit into critical uh, decisions that we have to take. And so we are taking from all angles. And I think Tema is benefiting because we have been part of the Cities Alliance and we've been uh, blessed with the um, studies of Cities Alliance. We've been blessed with the future uh, Cities Africa. And these are other platforms that we are leveraging on to which we are now driving development. As we speak now, the port of Tema has received one point. $5 billion investment for port expansion. Um, Tema as an assembly is um, in, in, in talks with uh, an invest, in investment consortium for $6.5 billion Tema, what we, we call the point of return project, which is coming to add to the tourism, the sports, um, and com uh, energy, clean energy, and other modern, sufficient, sufficient, and affordable city development. All these things, many people have said the sustainable development goals are heavily hinged on cities. And if they are hinged on cities, then cities must be ready. And so we must begin to get ourselves in readiness. Most often, Mayor, I'm gonna we ask mention... You for one, one more minute. One, one more minute. Go ahead. Most cities have... Uh, most people have described goal 11 which is the inclusive, safe, uh, and uh, sustainable cities as the overarching. And I do share in that, in that argument because what, when you build a solid city, you are talking about improving the lives of all and not leaving anyone behind, whether it is housing, whether it's uh, uh, poverty, which is um, goals one and two, whether it's uh, uh, good health uh, uh, and well-being, yeah, you are achieving that. And so... All the 17 goals must speak to each other. They must be inclusive. And that is what we are seeing in, in, in Tema now, that whilst we are developing the industrial enclaves, we are also making room for housing. And so currently, we have um, completed the affordable housing, which is to augment the middle to low income workers in Tema. Mm -hmm. And so I think that Tema has already seen the implementation or began the implementation of the sustainable development goal. What we need is to take advantage of the support we have with the Ministry of Finance to push our 15 major investment programs. So far, we have rolled out three major infrastructural development. And it's amazing how people are interested in financing this because they are economically sustainable, they are commercially viable, and so we are not talking about aids. We are talking about partnership, which is one of the five pillars of the sustainable development. We are ready for partnership. We are ready for financing because we want to get the city ready for the port expansion and the industrial expansion that we are already seeing. Excellent. And so all in all, the, the national agendas are supporting the local agenda and Tema hopes to lead the way. Excellent. I'm, I'm going to stop you there. Thank you very much for that. And I thought it was very interesting to see or to hear how the challenges that Billy had set out, actually Tema is, it sounds like, already rising to all those challenges from kind of capacity development through to financing. Even your point about, you know, bringing in the poor, not locking out the poor. Very interested to hear your reference to leaving no one behind as, as integral to this agenda as well. So th th we'll come back to you, but thank you very much for that, for that opening. Um, let me turn now to Paula, as I say, a research fellow in the Growth, Poverty and Inequality Programme. Um, Paula's worked on the SDGs, urbanisation, poverty, poverty measurement, um, growth issues for a long time. Um, she's going to present a city scorecard. I'll just give you a, a couple of seconds of background on this. We've been, um, since the SDGs were signed, we've been producing um, scorecards that set out the scale of the challenge. What's the job that needs to be done to meet the SDGs? We did the first one globally. We've done regional ones. We've done ones for Sub-Saharan Africa, for Asia, for Latin America. And Paola is now going to talk to you about the cities one. It's, it's basically using, looking at trends, 
and projecting forward trends through to 2030 to be able to see, you know, across each goal area what needs to be done. So, Paola. Thank you. Five Thank minutes. you, Liz. So thank you very much, Liz. Um, first, a bit of kind of introduction on the motivation, why we did this. And I think, again, a lot has been said. Um, given the rate of urbanization and pressures put on infrastructure in many developing country cities, we know that if we don't get that right today, this will have a huge impact on decades to come. And um, in order to actually achieve the SDGs, we need to get that right. And I think uh, Billy was talking about this sense of urgency. So um, that plus the fact that a lot of local governments actually have responsibility for many of the targets that we see on the SDGs, for example, on water and sanitation and housing, uh, we thought that it would be really useful to understand the scale of the challenge for cities. Um, and again, you know, kind of reiterate the point that without cities on board, the SDGs are not going to be achieved, really. So what we've done is, uh, as um, Liz was mentioning, uh, focusing and drawing on the methodology of previous reports, a forward-looking study. So we've seen or we've heard about uh, some um, studies or reports on what it means to localise the SDGs. So how do we implement in, um, in local areas and in cities? But I think what we felt was missing is a view on the scale of the challenge that is forward-looking. Um, so just to give you a flavour of the uh, cities that were included in our study, we drew on the demographic health survey that has data comparable for different countries. And we needed to have two data points in order to be able to do these projections. So, uh, because they are they're very simple and just based on historical trends and projecting those forwards. So these are the 20 cities for, the, for which we could uh, undertake this study. And we also had to um, select a series of targets for which we had um, data on. And there were about eight targets we were able to do the projections for. Um, so just to very briefly, I don't want to bore you with details and you have the uh, reports with you or you can access it online, but basically what we've done in terms of trying to communicate um, very quickly and in a simple way uh, where cities would be with regards to the likelihood of achieving uh, the, SD, the selected SDG targets by 2030 is developed a grading system. So we, we've gave seven grades, depending on how far away they would be from achieving the target. And then to make it simpler, we actually group them into three uh, categories. So you can see them there, reform, revolution, and reversal. So reform is where those targets are on track. Revolution is where progress needs to be boosted, actually, to be able to achieve the SDGs. And reversal is where trends actually need to be uh, change completely. They're going in the right, based on historical trends, they're going in the wrong direction. So just to give you an overview of the findings, it's a mixed picture. We did find that um, some cities were on current trends based on the DHS data, uh, were making progress on issues such as access to electricity and the five mortality, uh, access to secondary education. But we found also that a majority of cities were needed to um, boost progress significantly, so under the revolution category, uh, on a number of targets such as, and I guess I think there are no surprises here, things like access to water and sanitation, access to housing, stunting, so the end, um, tar uh, end hunger uh, target as well. Um, and we also found incidents of uh, reversal. Most of these, all of these actually were in Africa and they were related to issues such as access to adequate housing um, and stunting, and there was one on access to water as well. Um, so that's just a flavor of the overall fi findings. Just let me walk you through three examples. Um, so this graph here shows uh, access to electricity, and this, this, as I mentioned before, fell within the reform category. So kind of on track or halfway there. And you can see the different points at 2000, a point around that, that um, year, the, the, the specific years vary depending on data availability. The point on 2010 
and then the projections for 2030 for 17 out of our 20 cities um, we found that there would be on current trends they would be on track to achieve this target now this is an example of stunting on the revolution category and here we found that uh, a, a large number of cities so what you see in here is incidence of stunting for children uh, in our selected cities, and in some cases, you'll see that progress has been uh, slow um, or slightly negative. So we have a majority of cities under the revolution category. And then just to give you an example of the reversal category, here we have um, the proportion of households with poor quality flooring, which includes things like dirt, dung, or leaves. And we find that actually the historical trend is increasing, so it's, it's, it's getting worse. Um, so this is one where for these four cities in Africa, we found that a reversal of trends would be needed to achieve the goal. So this gives you a flavor of the uh, work that we've done. You've got more details on, on the report. But it's just to understand the scale of the challenge and where different cities are with regards to these different uh, this selected targets. Just to conclude, three recommendations that, again, I think resonate with some of the things that we've been hearing. First of all, central governments and donors should work to strengthen local governments' capacities. And then two others that are more data-related in terms of monitoring the SDGs and some of these issues we've been discussing. Government and cities administrations should invest more in ways to monitor progress on SDGs and statistical offices and cities' information systems should improve the data available. So I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much for that, Paolo. And as Paolo said, that's, we'll, this is the launch of this report today. So, um, yeah, I think it's really nice to be able to launch at a time where we've had Keto and can think about, reflect on, now we know a little bit about the discussions that have been happen, happening. Now we know about precisely the precise metrics on the scale of the challenge. Where does this take us? I want to open it to the floor and, and people watching online for questions, but um, I wanted to use my chair's privilege just to ask Paola. I, I could actually, she sits next to me, I could actually turn to her and ask her this question at work, but I will ask her in front of all of you for your <laughs> entertainment. Um, I want to know, I mean, coming out of keto, what was your main takeaway? What's your, what's your big readout? Yeah, I think, um, I think again, there was a lot of excitement around the urban, uh, the new urban agenda, and you see the numbers of people attending kind of these um, conference compared to others is actually much larger. But I think, uh, as Billy was mentioning, I think one of the key challenges for me, and I guess takeaway, is a risk of overlap. I, I know Billy was saying that they're not competing agendas, so in a way you could think about the S so uh, just to finish the sentence, overlap with the SDGs and other global agendas, because some of the, when you read the new urban agenda, a lot of the commitments and aspirations are very similar to those that are already in, in some of these other global agendas. Um, but that doesn't mean that they are necessarily competing. You could see them as complementary. And actually, one of the challenges of weaknesses that I see from the new urban agenda is this lack of, and the previous ones, I guess, is the lack of a monitoring or follow-up framework. And the SDGs actually have that. So I think there's an opportunity there to use the um, monitoring framework that the SDGs have um, and think about the urban agenda, about the, the how to, to implement okay. the goals. Okay, great. And I might come back and ask you the same question, and, and Mayor Pema, I assume we still have on, um, Mayor Adamton, we still have online. But let me first um, come to you and ask for questions, please. I might take the questions in groups. The gentleman at the back, can you just wait for the microphone, but if you could introduce yourself before you give us your question, please. That would be great. Thank you. Um, 